Each week, Richard and Father Mark present a rigorous discussion of the Bible in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. Over 24,000 episodes are downloaded each month at no charge. Please consider marking your level of support with a one-time donation or by pledging a small amount per episode. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. People deal with the miracles and parables of Jesus as biblical vignettes that can be extracted from the Gospels and presented on their own. Biblical scholars refer to these vignettes as pericopes, literally, a section of the Bible that has been cut out and extracted from the narrative. The problem, of course, is that a section of the Bible, like a sentence or a single word, when taken out of context, loses its meaning. Nowhere is this more evident than in the healing of the paralytic in Mark. If we hear the parable without the urgency and emphasis of Jesus' physical movement in chapter 1, the miracle cannot be understood correctly. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 147 of the Bible as Literature podcast. One thing that's very important in biblical studies, in the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis, which is an ancient school is that you deal with the text. Father Paul Tarazi has pushed it further to say you deal with the text as a complete narrative. You don't take it apart. You don't act as though one book has nothing to do with another book. You deal with what the text is saying in a particular context to a particular audience, but you never let go of the entire canon. This is true of a sentence within a paragraph, a paragraph within a section, a section within a book, and a book within the canon. And as we're reading through the Gospel of Mark, it becomes more evident to me that the way people use the Bible today is completely broken. Whether you are a biblical scholar in an Ivy League university who's disassembling the Bible on the floor of the garage, as Nikolai Roddy says, like a carburetor that you can't put back together again, or you're a fundamentalist who's either proof texting or taking sections of a book out and doing retreats on three sentences or three paragraphs, whatever it is you're doing with the Bible. If you're not reading a sentence in a paragraph and a paragraph in a section and a section in a book and a book in the canon, you're not reading scripture. Now, with respect to Mark, what people tend to do is take out these pericopes and lift them out as though they're complete units on their own. But this is a fallacy. In the Byzantine church, if you're listening to the Sunday lectionary, but you haven't been reading the entire book, the Sunday lectionary is non-functional because a story about Jesus healing the paralytic is not complete in and of itself. Something comes before it and something comes after it. We saw this when we were looking at the Corinthian literature. If you make the assumption that Paul is trying to make a statement with 1 Corinthians, a statement with 2 Corinthians, then it is logical that in dealing with Mark, Mark is trying to make a point. It's not a biography, it's literature, but it's still making a point about this character in the story, Jesus. And not who he is, but how he functions. And he functions correctly as a teacher, meaning the subject is not him. The subject is the teaching he is carrying to the people he is ministering to. It's very difficult for people to understand. But Jesus is explicit in the Gospel of John when he says, I don't do any judging. I only see what people are doing, and I hear what my Father says. And I apply what my Father says to what people are doing, and that's how I judge. Meaning he himself doesn't judge. It's the teaching that judges. So, in effect, Mark, already in chapter 1, is a story about the fulfillment of the promise in the prophetic literature that the Torah would be carried 
to the nations and that God would establish his heavenly city in Ezekiel, the true Zion, as the homeland of the human race under the authority of the one God of Ezekiel. So the teaching is on the move in chapter 2, and it's the same teaching that Jesus was carrying in chapter 1. And we were pushing so much this point that we see over and over again of the urgency that Jesus is teaching, that it's not even enough to sleep in in the morning. He has to go and teach. I don't want to lose that momentum as we enter into chapter two, because we see that it's not just on the move. It's on the move quickly with urgency. When we read chapter two, we need to keep on that track to see the urgency that Jesus is functioning under. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. In the Greek, it's less specific. He was at a house. He was at home somewhere, not necessarily his home. But the point is, Jesus has no place to lay his head in the gospel. He calls no place home. He is the mobile chariot carrying the Torah in Ezekiel. Don't forget, in the last chapter, they were trying to get him to stay in the house, and he kept escaping the house and kept leaving the house, and they tried to find him so they could get him to heal more people, and then he would get out from their grasp before they could keep him in there. So here they got him like, aha, we've got him. He's in a house. We've got him locked down. The word for temple in Hebrew is the house of the God. Let's keep him here so we can get what we need out of him. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even at the door, and he was speaking the word to them. So we have this problem that pastors misinterpret as a good problem to have. It's not a good problem to have because the reason there's so many people gathered around is because they are still having this emotional experience of amazement that he's doing all these signs and wonders and they've come to see the fireworks. He's trying to teach, but they're crowding around to see the fireworks. The problem is that they themselves, if they're looking for fireworks, aren't going to hear the message and those who are in need of the message won't be able to reach Jesus. The people really want to lock down Jesus. They want him to stay so they know where he is, they can bring their sick to him, so they can have them healed. The problem is that Jesus wants to take the word out. He's always wanting to move out, wanting to move out, wanting to move out, and they want to lock him down. This is the tension between Jesus and the people. It's the same problem as Jerusalem. So you have the problem of the temple in Jerusalem. You have a synagogue in Capernaum. This is a house, but it's metaphoric literature. You build a synagogue in Capernaum where people can go and hear the word. Now he's at a home in Capernaum, like a house church, so to speak. But whether it's the temple, the synagogue, or a house church, the problem is everybody who's there doesn't care about everybody who's outside. That's why he has to keep moving. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So in order to get the paralytic to Jesus, to be evangelized, they had to go around the crowd and come through the top of the house. So they're having to work overtime to get one sick man to Jesus. Now, what's interesting about the metaphor of paralysis and the metaphor of sickness in general in Mark is that it helps the hearer of the gospel connect with the urgency of what Jesus is doing. But the urgency isn't specific to the man's illness. It makes sense to you that they would climb on the roof and open the roof up because you've all seen paramedics and firemen go to great lengths to help somebody. That's the scene, but that's a trick. The urgency is the urgency of what Jesus has to say, but you would never understand that because all of you are looking at your watch because you want to know when the football game is starting during church. So no one's going to hear Mark and be excited that we're ripping open the roof to let someone down because Jesus is teaching. So in a way, just the fact that you're excited the paralytic is going to be healed means that you yourself are as bad as the crowds in the house. I'm not saying the intentions of these four men are good. What I'm trying to say is that in order for the gospel to get you to understand the urgency of the gospel, it has to play on your anticipation of your own amazement at Jesus's magic trick. So you're not excited that they're letting them down in the house because there's a possibility that the paralytic will hear Jesus teach. You're excited that he might be healed. And that's the problem. The four men and the paralytic all need to hear the word. Yeah. But the four men think that they're 
coming to Jesus for the sake of their friend, the paralytic. They think that they're just helping out. They don't understand that they have something that they need to learn as well. The problem here is the same problem that Jesus was facing before, which is that everyone thought Jesus was there so that they could have an easier life, so that they could be sick and then healed, rather than hear the word that Jesus brings, which can be a difficult word. And it can challenge the way that people think. The point is the four men are bringing the paralytic so he can be healed bodily, but we're going to see what actually happens to that. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is recognizing that the four men trust in him. And now he's teaching. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And here's why people always get this wrong. They think that this is a showdown over Jesus' identity and that Jesus is now going to prove he's God by forgiving sins, but that is an incorrect reading. The person who talks that way talks like the people who are amazed at the miracles because you reveal that you haven't read scripture because it is the Torah and the prophets that teach us that no one is righteous but God and that man's righteousness dangles from the lips of God in his mercy. So when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, he's going against the priesthood in Hosea, which you speak of so often, Richard. Because what they do is use the sins of the people to keep the people trapped in church because it's good business and there are crowds in the temple. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't need the temple. The Torah declares you forgiven. Why is this surprising to everybody? So the way the Pharisees function here and the scribes, they function the way Judas does in the Gospel of John when he says, shouldn't we save some money for the poor? Which is how James functions in Galatians when they say in Jerusalem, shouldn't we set aside some money for the poor? They're quoting scripture, but they're not talking scripture. Getting back to what we said at the beginning, Richard, about how people proof text, the scribes and the Pharisees are proof texting Jesus' teaching. When Jesus sees a paralytic, the first thing he addresses is sin. Not the fact that he's paralyzed. With the leper before, he said, you want to be clean? Yeah, I'll make you clean. A guy walks into the emergency room who's having a heart attack, and they say, don't worry, you can live a happy life. He'll say, thank you very much, but I would prefer that you handle my heart attack first. Why is Jesus not addressing the paralysis, but instead of addressing the sin? In Hosea, sin is a sickness. It's something that Israel is born with. And the Lord is trying to diagnose exactly what the problem is because the sin is rebellion and rebellion is the opposite of faith, of trust. Now these people come in and he says, I noticed that you trusted, therefore I'm going to forgive your sins. Meaning the one who trusts is the one who is attempting to give up their rebellious ways. And like you say, Father, Jesus is simply revealing to him what scripture is saying. Now. They don't understand that sickness and sin are related. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. We don't know what's in their head. But obviously they came not as five people who need to hear Torah, but four people who could help a paralyzed man. So Jesus is changing the discussion from one about, like you say, fireworks and healing, to one about teaching and sin, rebellion and faith and trust as the deep sickness of human beings. Then we have the Pharisees. Why does this man speak that way? This is rebellion. They're not questioning Jesus. They're questioning the Torah. This is the core problem. And as you pointed out, this odd turning around of priorities in the minds of the heroes of the story. Because as I said, you are all waiting, listening to the story for Jesus to heal the paralytic. And Jesus flips it because he's showing you, you're just as bad as everybody else. You're not here because I'm preaching. You're here because you want something material from me. And I'm offering you the word of my father. Your priorities are backwards. But here's the thing. If you, O oh scribes and Pharisees, would have been preaching the word of my father, this man wouldn't be sick. So I've got to make sure you understand that the forgiveness of sins is the will of God. Why don't you get it? 
if you understood that, you wouldn't be looking down your nose at people outside of Jerusalem and telling me they're unclean. You wouldn't look at the village of grace as though it were a slum because they're not part of the Jerusalem hierarchy. Jesus is messing with the whole matrix here. Jesus is making sure that their priorities are straight. This is how he's messing with the matrix. He's saying, you think the sickness is in your body. I'm telling you, your sickness is in your heart, meaning your mind and your ability to reason. This is where the sin of rebellion has planted itself. We need to deal with that. Everyone in this room is sick, including the scribes and the Pharisees. They think that they can judge. They think they can speak on God's behalf. But what they want to do is keep the man in sin, whereas Jesus wants to free him from his sin. They want to keep him sick. Jesus wants to heal him. And this is exactly like you say what the priest is doing. The priest in Hosea chapter 4 is withholding Torah so that the people continue to sin. And as they continue to sin, they continue to enrich the priest with the sin offering. Their very thoughts betray their false teaching. Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Again, immediately. He needs to begin teaching immediately. Secondly, one interesting thing is I've been noticing in Ephesus school as we're teaching the book of Acts, that the spirit has a specific function, which is to tell the teacher of the word where to teach and where not to teach. The Spirit says, go out to teach. The Spirit says, don't teach here, but keep walking. Here, Jesus is immediately needing to teach, and his Spirit is what made him realize it's time to teach because they think incorrectly, and he realizes that the way that they're thinking requires a word, which is, why are you sick still in your heart? You're supposed to know the word. How can you still be sick with the rebellion that causes you to continue to sin and no longer to trust. And here Jesus is not being clairvoyant. This is not Jesus using his powers to read people's minds and see into their hearts like magic. This is wisdom. The way that Jeremiah was able to speak with authority as a teenager. The way in the rabbinic tradition, a child with a beard is like a wise old man. Someone who reads Torah is wise beyond their years. So you have to read this as though Jesus is an old man who's been teaching for 40 years. Who knows what the students are going to say when he gives the teaching? And you still think it's magic because you don't know the teaching. I want to stress this point. There's no magic here. This is all about the hard work of Bible study. That's why Jesus knows what they're going to do. He knows what they're going to do the same way that Michael Jordan knows whether you're going to fake left or fake right. It's not magic. He's been playing basketball for forever. So just understand it that way and you'll begin to see what's really happening in the text. And then he says this beautiful line, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. And I will tell you right now, which is easier. It's easier to heal him. That's the point Jesus is making. Nobody wants to do the work of Bible study. Nobody wants to come and sit down and listen to what is being taught everybody wants to be righteous everyone wants to be a savior everyone wants to feel good they want to be amazed but no one wants to do the real work of sowing the seed the hard thing to do O scribes and pharisees is to teach that's what this is about the healing follows but the teaching is the priority whether the healing follows or not because the healing is up to god your job isn't to decide what the fruit of the sowing is. Your job is to sow. And this is what Jesus is demonstrating. Jesus understands that the desire to see the miracle is the weak spot. That's why in chapter 1, when everyone wanted to clog the streets to have him heal, he had to escape. He had to leave. He had to hide. When someone came who needed healing, he had to say, go and be obedient to Torah, don't go and tell everybody, because it's going to make my job harder. When the leper went and told everybody anyway, then we got to see how much harder it was for Jesus. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Jesus 
is literally being dismissive of the thing that everyone else thinks is important. Just to underscore your point, Richard. He's saying, look, this is the real work, but you don't understand and you're not going to listen. So you know what? Just pick up your palate and walk. And by the way, the walking you're supposed to be doing isn't walking like you're healed and everything's fine, yay. The walking you're supposed to be doing is to walk according to my precepts and my commandments and not turn away from my instruction. Like it says in Deuteronomy, you teach Torah to your child when you stand up, when you sit down, when you go in, when you go out. This is the time that you are supposed to be teaching Torah, which means all the time. So if you say to me, Father Mark, why can't it be that he just told him to get up and pick up his pallet and walk? It can't be because of what Richard just said. Because if you've read scripture a thousand times, you would know what's going on here. If he gets up without Torah in his heart, then he's going to get up and teach whatever he teaches, which is hooray for me. Look what Jesus did for me. And end up paralyzing more people. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed. There's that amazement again. They were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Which is not good news. Correct. Jesus is not trying to impress them. Jesus is trying to get them to trust. Jesus is trying to get them to have faith. Jesus is trying to get them to stop rebelling. Jesus is trying to get them to stop thinking about themselves. And all they can say is, ooh, ah, this is very impressive. Now, I have to say that the paralytic of all the characters in this section behaved correctly. Jesus gave him an order and he followed it. He was told to get up and walk, metaphorically, according to God's precepts, which Jesus is giving him by speaking to him. And he does so. It's not the fault of the paralytic that they're all amazed any more than it's the fault of Jesus. It's the mob that's wrong. And remember, this is the Roman Empire in which Caesar plays to the mob all the time. Jesus is not playing to the mob. This isn't the arena. He's not interested in the passions of the crowd. He's, He's interested, interested in, in teaching. teaching. And he went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him. And he was teaching, teaching them. them. He needed to leave the house He's only going to be effective when he's outside. And we've seen this since the very first verse of the book. Jesus functions when he is out, when he is on the move. Otherwise, people clog his way up. They keep him from moving because all of their ooing and eyeing. They didn't leave when the paralytic left. If they had only left, he could have gone and immediately went and find more people to teach. But instead, he had to wait till everybody left so he could get out of the house and move on to do the next part of his job. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.